Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to this 11th week of the CAET 2 class in the second semester of the academic year 2019-2020. It is uh, March 26 in the year 2020. I'm still uh, teaching from home because, of course, of the uh, current way that we're dealing with COVID-19. Um, today's topic um, is reverse engineering in a broader sense and uh, I'll talk quite a bit about what this term actually means, what it should mean. Um, maybe I'll talk a bit about the common misunderstandings. Um, so a bit more methodology this time because usually this class as you know is about how you use the computer specifically, how you use engineering software. But again, this uh, this time I'll, I'll talk a bit more about uh, method, methodology, the whole background of that. So, hang on. So, uh, what is reverse engineering? Um, well, in order to answer that, you should maybe first think about what engineering actually is. Uh, to make something is not really engineering, that would be production. So I would say engineering is the production of data that uh, would allow you to uh, make something based on that data, right? It's not only that, not everything is production oriented, uh, but at least when you're talking about uh, production oriented uh, engineering that, that would typically end in a set of documents uh, that would uh, allow you to start producing something. And uh, in last semester's course, machine design process, we've covered uh, a design process, design methodology, a series of steps towards this goal of having a complete set of documents of data to start production. And you see on the right side of that slide, you would see the de uh, engineering design process according to the German a guideline VDI 2221. So we've, you've seen that a million times. So uh, if you now take the term reverse engineering, that obviously means uh, it, it is the other way around. Um, and that is basically true. So, so I'll, I'll define reverse engineering as uh, the production of engineering data based on physically existing products or components. So you, you really start at the end of the of the regular process, and um, and that means if you if you if you think that that thought to the end, that means that really the uh, the results, the final results of that process of reverse engineering, would be producing data that we usually have at the beginning of the uh, engineering design process. And that is at least to some degree true. Uh, proper and true reverse engineering will actually, as it says here, uncover original design requirements and restrictions. So this is really that uh, you should try to do when you really reverse engineer a product or a component. Um, the, the underlying questions are always, now what is the function that this part has to fulfill what is the function that this feature on the part should fulfill? What are the restrictions or requirements that led to this specific design of the component or of its features? Or it could be the whole product uh, or the whole system, of course. You can reverse engineer any level of complexity uh, as you can engineer or design on any level of complexity. That means you could Actually, you, you could reverse engineer just a feature uh, on a part, uh, like a surface or something, or you could reverse engineer a complete part, you could uh, reverse engineer a complete uh, product or system, and so on and so on. So the next question is, why would you want to reverse engineer? Uh, if we were in a classroom together, uh, this question would be pretty easy to answer for most, at least uh, most people think it's easy. Uh, most would say, well, we want to copy a part, right? That, that is uh, the answer I most commonly get. And I would say, no, uh, that is uh, not the only correct or completely correct answer. So um, 
in a more general sense, uh, there is a specific situation that might motivate uh, someone or a company to uh, go through a reverse engineering process. And that in the most general way would be uh, engineering data for something, for a component or product is not available, but it's needed. That, that would be the most general wording for that. Now, of course, the question is, uh, why would you need that? Why would you need engineering data for a product that physically exists already? Uh, now, if we start with maybe the most common uh, scenario where parts are just copied, that would be the aftermarket. For example, automotive aftermarket. There's a supplier or a company or an individual that wants to supply a component uh, to sell it as a replacement part. Maybe you want to uh, offer a replacement part for an automotive that hasn't been produced for a very long time. Right? Um, that is a, is a completely a valid and, and okay reason to reverse engineer and then produce a part based on reverse engineer data. Another reason could be uh, uh, just benchmarking, professional benchmarking in, a, uh, in an engineering sense. And again, um, the reason for reverse engineering would not just be to have a CAD model of a component, so you'd be able to produce that, but really the, uh, the more interesting part of that motivation would be to understand what requirements led to this specific design. Um, be because really this, uh, this understanding of the uh, design intent, design rationale is, is really the most valuable knowledge in that context. There's also another reason uh, which seems unbelievable uh, if you're still a student and you look at industry as, wow, everything is professional and perfect, uh, the original producer might have lost their own data. Um, that happens more often than you would think. So uh, you might actually own uh, the rights to a specific product and you might, you probably have been producing parts or products. And then for some reason you need the data again, but you simply don't have them. Uh, one good reason, uh, and I'll give you an example for that from my own experience, uh, might be that uh, your company has been producing a product for a long time and the tools are worn out. Um, so you have to make new tools to keep on producing, but you simply don't have the, three, the data, mostly 3D data. Um, in a, in a similar context, you might want to revise an existing design, but you don't have the engineering data. Uh, you might want to reissue a product that has been discontinued, uh, or you, and that, that I mentioned, as the first example, you, you might want to uh, offer spare parts for your own product long after the time when you originally produced them. So there's, there's a, a lot of reasons, good reasons, valid reasons uh, to, go into reverse engineering process. And maybe uh, one of the best reasons is just learning. Now, I haven't listed it uh, yet, but I believe reverse engineering is, um, is a great approach to learning about design. Uh, so I've, I've been using this uh, in, in our MESD program quite extensively. We are in a very good situation that we don't have too many students. Uh, like in Aachen, I used to have more than 1,000 students. You, you cannot do reverse engineering there because you need actual parts and, and, and uh, a lot of face-to-face -face discussion. But in our little groups, uh, maybe up to 15 people, it's still possible. Um, so last semester, we did, basically, we did reverse engineering on, on the transmission of the Tamiya car. Um, and uh, I'll give you a little assignment. Uh, for this unit now. Um, one year ago when we didn't have corona yet, uh, I, I gave the students uh, a bigger uh, um, assignment, which means a, a more complex part to reverse engineer. But before we'll go there, uh, just the one example, and, and you must be sick of that because I, I always keep on mentioning this project. But this is also an example of a reverse engineering, uh, a very realistic situation. Uh, I've mentioned that it was my great pleasure and honor 
almost two decades ago to uh, to be involved in the uh, design uh, of the original product of this office chair producer. Uh, the brand is called Martin Stoll. The brand still exists, and I mentioned a few times that it's um, at least until ve uh, the very uh, recent past, you could still buy the original product that had this mechanism, this office chair mechanism. So that was uh, finished maybe 2001, 2002, and the company started producing that. You need tools for the two aluminum housings and all the other components, but um, just for the uh, for the aluminum casting process, you need two tools, um, and these tools, uh, these two molds, they wear with time. Uh, so it's it's a good thing this this thing has been sold and sold and sold, and of course the tools wore off. There, there's a lot of friction and of course thermal uh, uh, strain on these tools. So often uh, bits of the molding surfaces uh, surface chip off and so on and so on and and just basically the tolerances of the part they deteriorate because the mold just wears off so uh, around 15 years after that that production launched the company said well we uh, we're still selling that mechanism and we're actually launching a new series based on that product so uh, it's time to replace the tools they're they're worn out but they didn't have the original engineering data, believe it or not. Uh, now, I know as a fact, because I produced the original data set, that I've given them all the 3D data. But uh, this, this company this, uh, has been sold at least two times. Uh, um, and um, in, in these processes, uh, that it, um, sometimes stuff gets lost, especially data, right? Uh, so this is what happened. And, and one, one other reason for that is, uh, at the original time, when, when I made the original design, uh, they simply didn't have like a real design department. Uh, that, that was kind of a silly trend, early 2000s, that many medium-sized companies got rid of their de uh, design departments because they believed they could uh, more effectively uh, buy these engineering services by, by offshoring, for example, from uh, buy these engineering services from India. Uh, and uh, in, in some some situations that work well, but but not for all medium-sized companies. So many had to uh, basically re-establish their own engineering companies. And it was during during this uh, this time uh, when the original uh, project was uh, was done. And uh, this is one of the reasons why why the three D data got lost. And that was one of the reasons could have been one of the reasons for a reverse engineering process based on existing products, existing tools that they have. But luckily, I still had my original data. Anyhow, uh, another interesting way to look at it is, is how is reverse engineering really, uh, really different from copying, as I said before. Uh, a more formal word for copying would be counterfeiting. Uh, so that would be uh, an illegal cop, an illegal copy. Now, uh, a copy is illegal if uh, the owner of the original design uh, doesn't agree to you copying it uh, and there is a, a proper legal reason uh, that protects uh, the ownership of the original design. Now, um, legally, that this is a bit more complicated, for example, uh, uh, there might be reasons why it's completely illegal to copy an existing product. For example, the original uh, design is very old, like similar to patents. Uh, so all intellectual property rights have expired legally. Um, another reason could be that uh, the original owner simply doesn't exist anymore, right? The original company that owned the design, um, and there is no other legal owner. Um, and so on and so on. So there are some legal reasons too. Uh, so uh, even one-to-one -one copying might actually be legal and not immoral, but typically, uh, count, well, uh, uh, typically it's associated uh, with being immoral and illegal. And if 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 it really is illegal, and if the uh, company or person that is actually trying to sell 
the, the copies, the counterfeit products, especially when they're trying to uh, create the impression that these are original parts, then it's a crime, of course. And there are many reasons uh, to try to stop such activities. So what is a reverse engineered component that is not a copy or a counterfeit part? Um, well, one characteristic would be that a, a well reverse engineered component can replace the original component, but it might look completely different. Um, and this is, uh, if you really understand what design is about, uh, this is basically if the uh, reverse engineered, uh, the new product, uh, fulfills all the requirements and restrictions and, uh, and the same functions as the original part. It doesn't necessarily need to have exactly the same shape, right? Um, and if, if you have some experience with design, you will realize that uh, even if you if you follow a good process, if you have a good methodology, there are still a lot of degrees of freedom in design that, that, that will show in the final embodiment design, the final shape of the parts. There might be uh, features and shapes that are not explained by a restriction or a, requir a requirement. In theory, that shouldn't be the case, but in reality, it is. There, uh, the design, uh, all design requirements or degrees of freedom are not always um, defined by restrictions and functions. And then, of course, there are many uh, form features or embodiment features that relate to the specific production process. And I have an, uh, a few nice examples for that. And um, if a reverse engineered part is produced in a different production process, that means that these production related features um, that, that would be under the headline of design for X. Uh, they're, they're simply not valid in the new context. Okay, so these are reasons why a reverse engineered part might look completely different than the original, even if it can replace it, right? So you, you, could, you could really take out the original component, let's say it might be a component of an engine or something, and then put in the, the, uh, the reverse engineered component, which looks completely different. In the ideal world, you can put it in because it uh, follows it fulfills all the original requirements. That would, of course, include dimensions, tolerances, and so on. Strength, whatever. Um, so the second point I mentioned already. So let's say, again, second point, uh, let's say you, you wanna, um, you need a spare part for a Mercedes-Benz car that was sold in the 1950s and 60s. Original parts are not available anymore as spare parts. So you, you might want to do, uh, so if you want to produce a replacement part, you will go through a reverse engineering process with the original part that might even be broken. You might have taken it out of the, out of the car that you own. And then, um, of course, you need to analyze everything. You, you, if, you, if you're using a, a used part, it's worn. So you can't take the, the dimensions, the original dimensions off uh, because all that material has been worn off. So you, you can't really take tolerance tolerances of a single part anyway because tolerances are a statistical thing right to 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 analyze the original tolerances of a mass production part you would have to look at a multitude of parts and uh, really measure how actual dimensions vary and then you would know something about the tolerances which is uh, the error or derivation uh, of of actual uh, dimensions right so if you if you basically uh, base your reverse engineering process on a single component, and if it's a worn one, even worse, uh, you really have to apply a whole lot of engineering understanding, knowledge, and experience to that to be able to determine the original tolerances and behind that the original requirements that led to these tolerances. Right, so it's not just about looking at geometry and copying that geometry. If you, if you copy um, a used part, a worn part, you, you will have the wrong, uh, the wrong dimensions because it's a worn part. You, then your, your uh, replacement part that you produce based on a reverse engineering process would, would just be already a, a worn part from the very beginning. This is just one example of the challenge of really reverse engineer on the base of a part. Now, uh, going back to that example of the Mercedes-Benz, right? 
you would uh, you would really have to understand what this part is doing, why it has worn, where it has worn, how it has worn, how much it has worn, uh, um, how it was originally produced, um, and then you you would understand uh, which of the form features are necessary uh, because they're based on functions and requirements that are still valid, and which of the form features are not necessary to copy. Okay. Um, now, of course, if I if I produce this spare part from my old Mercedes Benz, and if I then sell it, uh, and I claim that this is original Mercedes Benz from the 50s because I found a box full of these parts, that would be criminal because I I just uh, I just um, make the customers believe of facts that are that are wrong, right? Um, Mercedes-Benz might still own the property rights to that part, although they might already have expired uh, because they're much too old. The original design of that specific part might be too old or because they simply don't offer that part. So Mercedes-Benz might even be happy about somebody offering these parts. Uh, so the whole business of, of spare parts, aftermarket and so on is pretty complicated one anyway, right? Uh, in any case, I want to make clear that I do not promote uh, illegal counterfeiting of parts here uh, and that reverse engineering is a serious and well-motivated uh, uh, situation and process that engineers should be able to handle. Uh, the final point on this slide is the conclusion that often uh, counterfeit or copy parts have a very bad quality and the reason is not always only because they use uh, bad materials for copies. That might be a a very valid reason but often the reason is that uh, whoever is making these copy parts they simply don't understand why the original part was designed the way it was so the part doesn't uh, fulfill requirements that are often so subtle you don't you don't really see them on on the finished part so uh, what is the reverse engineering process well basically it's the process that you know already going the other way around but i made that a bit clearer here uh to stress a few points now the the first most important aspect would be really to understand the original design intent that is what what i expressed before as uh realizing what were the original functions that that uh the design the original design uh tried to fulfill what were the original requirements or restrictions um and this is is listed here first the function and many many sub functions of the part auxiliary functions and so on and then production related restrictions assembly related restrictions material related restrict restrictions if you can identify these you can actually uh, based on your understanding change this design because maybe you have better materials available maybe because you have better production uh, uh, uh technologies at hand so you can uh you can omit the features that were based on the original restrictions and you can replace them with new ones um or maybe just because you don't want to produce 100,000 of them as the original design did so the the original design might have been a cast part for that reason but you simply want to uh, produce five pieces of them so you would machine them and then you don't have to copy the features that, that were there to fulfill the original casting process. Now, I, I said that basically many times, and I hope I, I, I'm getting the point across. So understanding would be the first uh, process, of course. Um, and then the second, uh, second big phase would be, of course, to document the original design. And um, documenting is something that engineers always have to do, but they never like to do it. To do documentation every engineer hates that it's, it's very boring uh, but it's also very important because what is what is all your understanding worth if you don't document it that that would mean that uh, uh, in a year time you would have to reverse engineer your own reverse engineering work because you simply forgot why you did it that way so again this is extremely important not only in original design but also in reverse design or reverse engineering um, so you would uh, take photographs of the original part, you take notes, you take uh, measurements, and then document these measurements. Um, and then you would, you would really write down in a report to yourself or to somebody else uh, 
why these features are there and what the original intention was and so on. And, and, and this, in, I would say in, in real life scenarios, that probably happens to a lesser degree than it should. Um, but now I've gone, I've personally gone through a lot of reverse engineering processes and I can only make that point. Documentation is really important to the success of this work. Um, because then also if you force yourself to document it, you, you force yourself to think about stuff uh, that you might not thoroughly think through. And then this will open many little doors to improvement of the original design, uh, to saving costs, right? So really um, the point that I, that I make many times, documentation is really like uh, formalized, visualized, externalized thinking of yourself. So really this needs to be do done. Normally, I make the students go through a reverse engineering process. I'll show you one example in a, in a few minutes. And uh, I'm not just happy with the CAD model, uh, but instead I want a, a document, a report. And in that report, I want uh, a real discussion of all the features, right? Otherwise, um, the value of that CAD design is rather limited. And then the uh, last phase would be redesign. And that, of course, in, in the context of today's technologies and in the context of this class, that would be remodel uh, or just model, basically. Because for the model, the CAD model that you create, it doesn't matter. It doesn't really matter if there's already an existing product or if it's just based on uh, a new design process, really, right? So, uh, but of course, the purpose is to 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 create something that's more or less already been there. So this is why it's called redesign. And I personally don't call it uh, redesign, or it should actually be reverse design, uh, but, uh, but it's redesign bec because you, you've gone through the same process. So you design it again. You don't reverse design it. Still, I call it reverse modeling if it's based on the actual geometry. And this is basically what we'll talk about now is how do I, uh, how do I get the geometry data? And I guess everybody knows uh, one way to do that, apart from manual measurements, could be 3D scanning. So um, the next example I'll show to you now is, is uh, pretty relevant, uh, especially in Thailand, because that, that would be a typical component that uh, might be issued by some illegal counterfeiting producer. Uh, but of course, the, the motivation for our study is not to, uh, to produce and illegally uh, sell that part, but just to uh, practice our engineering skills. And the part I chose uh, and I gave to the students last year was uh, this, this head of the front fork of a motorbike. Now, this is actually my own motorbike. Uh, Honda Zuma, uh, 2015 year or 16 year, 15. And it's uh, a great motorbike. I can only stress that many times. Um, and so this part is what we're looking at. And if, if you're studying uh, with us here, you, uh, you will realize that the reason I chose this is because it combines many aspects of what we cover in various courses. Uh, one, of course, it's a vehicle part. Second, it's uh, an aluminum cast part. So many of the features are based on uh, the casting process. And then, of course, many of the features are based on how the steering of a motorbike really works. There's a bearing in there, uh, a bearing arrangement, as I, as I call it, because, of course, for the steering motion. So there are two, uh, it's not thrust ball bearings. In, in theory, there should be angular ball bearings. But if you look at the actual parts, they, they kind of look like thrust ball bearings. And, of course, so they come in. Uh, in an X type arrangement. Um, they're adjustable. Uh, it is necessary to adjust the exact action in, in, that, in that bearing arrangement. Um, there's a lot of interesting joints and connections here, right? So it basically sums up a lot of the stuff that we've been doing in the first and second semester. So this is why I, uh, I'm very confident that this is a wonderful choice for, for a good exercise for students. And last year, we scanned this thing. Um, and actually, I remember at, on that actual day when, when we scanned it, uh, and the students were in the room because that was the demonstration of the 3D scanning process. 
that we actually scheduled for last week, um, but we couldn't do it um, for Corona reasons. And uh, so when they scanned it, they did two things that I wasn't very happy about, but I wasn't there, so I can't complain. One of the reasons is that they, uh, they didn't take off a part that, that is, you can still see that. So this part uh, that, that I'm showing here with my mouse, hopefully, that is a, a sheet metal part and it was bolted to the actual part that we're discussing. So, uh, so I didn't want to have that one on, um, but it's not, not a big deal. The other thing is they, uh, they, they gave us uh, only half of the scanned geometry. And it seems uh, like a reasonable decision because the part is mainly symmetrical. Now, uh, and then you can save a lot of data. And this file is gigantic, no, not gigantic. It has, it has around 100 megabytes, the STL file. Um, but still, I'd, I'd rather have the complete geometry and then I'm able to, to check measurements on that. Now, if I have only half of the part, it's a scan. Uh, so nobody can guarantee this is really separated. The, the, the plane of symmetry is really 100% perfect, right? Um, now, I can, of course, more or less measure the distance, let me just go back. Here you see the original part, you see on the left side, the right side, you see the, the two uh, shock units, and, and maybe the most important measure of this part is the distance of the two axes, right? And it's, it's not uh, trivial to, to measure the exact distance of these two. Uh, so if, if I have the actual part, in order to measure the distance, I would probably put I, I could try, of course, to use a caliper, but then you see one problem here already. There are, uh, this is slitted here, right? So, uh, so if I wanted to, to measure the distance of these two holes, I can only, of course, uh, measure that on existing surfaces. And exactly where I want to put my caliper to, to measure the outside to outside distance, we have this, this slit here. So I can't do it, of course. I can measure inside to inside, and, and I can measure the uh, diameters of these holes. And then, of course, I can calculate something, but there will always be uh, tolerances in that. Because in reality, I always, I always assume that the original design intent was to use a pretty regular number. Um, that, that's one, one good example already. Now, the question is, uh, what unit systems were the original uh, designers thinking in? If you copy something from the States, United States of America, uh, they might be using imperial units, right? So they, they're thinking in inches, multiples of inches and fractions of inches. Um, but then many other countries, they would think and design in the metric system. Now, this is a Honda part. Uh, I would assume that they're using the metric system. So then if I measure something and the the result of my measurements and calculations would be one 199.2 i would assume my measurement is faulty and i would assume the original design intent was that this distance is 200 millimeters but if it's from the states i would check what uh multiples of inches that would relate to closest and then i would assume Okay, this is so and so many inches and a fraction, blah, blah, blah. Okay. And then, of course, uh, in the car industry, there's a lot of dimensions that is imperial based on the inch system for traditional reasons. Now, even if you buy a spare part from Japan or Germany, uh, in a specific context, that might still be based on, on imperial dimensions, on inches, right? So this is uh, examples for the, the process of reverse engineering, the thought process and the engineering knowledge and experience that has to go in, into that process to, to draw the right conclusions. Okay, now, now while we're talking about this one, this is uh, the scan data shown in, uh, in Creo again in a 3D uh, CAD system. Now, in, in, this, uh, in this style of representation, 
um, the edges are not shown as black lines. Otherwise, this image would be mostly black. Uh, because as you will see in, in a later slide, uh, the scan data basically is a lot of points in space. And in order, order to visualize that, the software will, will create little edges between each point. So um, if you have uh, three points, then uh, the computer software will connect them with three straight lines and that gives you a little piece of surface um and um uh no. suddenly i can't think of the word uh it will come back in a, in a second so uh so basically it it generates uh a an artificial surface based on facet it's called a facet surface or facet model so these little Triangular surfaces are called facets, and um, uh, they're very small facets if you have a very high resolution in scanning. Um, and again, you will, uh, that will become clearer uh, in the later slides. What you hear, uh, see here is, uh, of course, a, um, a simulated reflection um, based on all these many facets. And because the uh, resolution of that scan for this one is extremely high, you don't really see that there are many facets here. And, and you can even see uh, how uneven the original surface was. Now I'll go back a few slides, or just one slide here. You'll see that the surface is, um, is powder coated, right? So that, that's one way of varnishing. So the typical powder coating surface is, is not, uh, doesn't look like a polished surface, but it looks, uh, it has this specific powder coating texture. and uh, and that texture might be uh, a little bit too fine to actually show in a scan, but uh, but if you go down one order of magnitude, it's it's a kind of wavy, and you and you seem to be able to see that already, right? What you definitely can see here is is this dirty kind of line here, and um, if you've been to my lectures in the last few weeks, you would probably guess correctly that this would be the marking where the two halves of the casting tool separate, right? So um, uh, this is a kind of complex geometry, not extremely complex, but uh, but you can already guess here that this this part is is molded, and the lower part of the geometry uh, um, is is created by the geometry of the lower mold and the upper part of the upper part. And that the separation of these two halves of the mold, the, uh, the the casting mold, is right here. So that, where's my mouse? This line that you're seeing here is a beautiful example of this separation line. Now it it kind of ends here. That's weird. Here we have a flat surface, and in the in a photograph in the actual part, you would see this is because it was machined. It was flattened by cutting off the surface. This is what you get. Uh, a lot with cast parts too, uh, that the, the what we call functional surfaces, uh, they, they, they won't work um, with the quality of the cast surfaces, cast surface, so they would be cleaned up by some sort of machining or even manual filing, for example, right? So keep this in mind, uh, rem uh, keep in mind how this, uh, this line looks in, the uh, scan representation on the screen and then it ends here and I claim this is because this surface has been machined. Try to keep it in mind, we'll look at the photo. Oh, we can't look in the photo. Uh, so maybe in that other photo you can see it. No, it's the wrong side. Uh, we were looking at the wrong side here. But anyhow, um, you see other examples. Now this is a photo that, that my student took. This is, I think this was taken by Dear Subu. Uh, Subu is currently in Germany. Uh, I will give him the link to that. Hi, Subu. Um, I, I hear you're doing fine. We, we've just had a line exchange a few hours ago, and I'm happy you're doing fine in Germany, even under the circumstances. Um, so with this part, uh, you see the uh, everything that is black are uh, surfaces that are not functional surfaces, right? And everything that is a functional surface, so that means it's, it's going to be in contact with a different part. Uh, this is where you can see the original color of the aluminum. And this is because it has basically been machined, maybe even after the coating process. 
uh, or it has at least been machined and then covered so it wouldn't be coated with with this black color uh, with this powder coating okay and now we're talking about the understanding of the part uh, this is like really clear and obvious here if you look at this part all the surfaces that have the original uh, uncoated metal color these are functional surfaces so that helps with the understanding of the part already and everything that is uh, powder coated that is black here these are surfaces uh, they they don't technically need to be exactly that way. If you actually change the shape, uh, you could still probably, highly likely, uh, still put that part into the motorbike and it would work just as well. So that's another small example of how that works. Now, with regards to the reverse engineering process, uh, the students were re reverse designing that, so to speak, uh, based on the scan but also based on the original part uh, and this is where we are where we hit our limitations in this year because of, we, we can't we can't meet so uh, this time i can't give you the actual part so we're using uh, a much simpler part uh, and you reverse engineer that based only on well what i show you today and on the stl data that, that i'm making available to you uh yeah so you see uh slide gauge uh, vernier caliper a pen very important a pen because you're taking notes all the time and you you're seeing two little parts that have been taken off now uh, these are the the counterparts to to these areas and of course they they lock the steering rod onto that part um, and i've actually advised uh, the student subo to uh, to first model the whole geometry including these caps and then cut them off later on because that that would give you the the uh, uh, a better workflow and uh, a better overall shape in the end. Yeah, uh, so this is just one screenshot from Subo's report of his final design. And you will realize that the immediate impression is that this is a different part, of, even if it's the same part. Uh, and this is just because suddenly we're looking at perfectly flat surfaces. It just doesn't feel uh, the same way, even if all the dimensions are correct. And of course, it's not finished. As you see here, the domes for the, for the screws that are used to to lock uh, the shock units here that they're not finished yet. You can see here uh, these are the domes, and uh, there will be a thread in one of these uh, in the lower one, and there will be a through hole for the screw on the other side. So, in that screenshot, that's not finished yet. Mm. And I guess some some bits still need to be cut off. But you 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 can see already that uh, what is in here is that this this separation or parting line of the two molds is already there the uh, the drafts that are necessary for the molding processes are already there these lines although at this point subu was a bit either lazy uh, or he he didn't realize that of course a parting line needs to be on these cylindrical domes for the screws too right because they're also in the parting uh, in the parting plane at this position. We, and these were the sort of design details that we've discussed in design for injection molding a few weeks ago. So uh, this was one application example, one, one pretty exciting one. I could, if you wanted to, I could give you the scan data for this one, <coughs> or at least uh, the scan data as I've shown to you for half the parts, but uh, just the scan data is, is 80, 80 megabytes. If you then import that with your CAD system, it will turn around 300 megabytes, 500 megabytes, something like that. Uh, so it's in your interest too to use a smaller geometry. And then we come back to, of course, my favorite topic. Uh, one of my favorite topics is, of course, musical instruments, especially saxophones. So um, one little thing I did, uh, and we did that one year ago too was to scan this little mouthpiece this is a a used mouthpiece uh, for a soprano saxophone uh, and you can see from the stem down here is from the yamaha brand now yamaha also makes motorbikes now this is the secret connection here between these two examples um, and of course uh, well there are many reasons uh, for me to use this example uh, I'm just purely interested in mouthpiece geometry and everything saxophone, but uh, but apart from that, it's 
it is uh, a geometry that looks kind of complicated, uh, although it's not that complicated. So it requires a lot of analysis and understanding of the design intent, and then you will understand how this geometry is really produced, and and then you can uh, use this understanding for them for your modeling steps. Um, and I'm using this example to also explain how 3D scanning really works. Now, um, what you can see here is uh, these little target stickers. Uh, and I mean, they, they look like, like the target you, you have when you're playing darts or something. And they are necessary because we're using uh, an optical uh, scanner that is not referencing um itself so to speak uh, there are uh scanning systems that are based on you could say robot arms with a lot of joints and there are sensors in the joints and these sensors are connected to the computer so if you move the camera on the robot arm then uh because the computer is aware of the position of each of of these joints uh, which which represent degrees of freedom it can calculate uh, the location in space of the points that are being scanned right but in this case we're using a handheld camera so the uh there's no way that the computer can can know what it is looking at because it doesn't know uh in which direction the camera is pointing and and where it is so uh the computer needs to to uh to put the the images that it sees uh, puzzle them together like like a jigsaw puzzle based on uh, recognizing each image and uh, it's actually it's 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 more like our own brain works right our brain is, is a pretty ingenious thing right we get a lot of these images from our eyes and uh, because we recognize these images we 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 can make sense of of that flow of images now Computers aren't that clever nowadays, so they need help. And, and these target st stickers are the help. So the trick is uh, if, if, the, if the, the software uh, will recognize three of these points, then it can calculate its relative position. And then all the other points, which are the actual geometry that we're scanning, can then be placed in space. So uh we are helping the computer software to make sense of the many images that we're taking while we're 3d scanning and it's obviously i have i failed to mention that it's it is uh, uh it's a visual scan basically so we can only scan what we what can be seen by the camera um and and that means we we cannot scan the inside geometry of that mouthpiece we can only scan as far as we can really look into it right but apart from that uh it's it's a visual process so there's a visual help in there we'll put a bunch of these stickers on it and the methodology here is that it needs to be as many stickers as uh, so from any position you uh, the the system can always see at least three of these stickers could be more um and then it can calculate And then uh, the software can calculate how each image relates to the others and can therefore add the scan information. So because if we're scanning, we have to move around that thing. And then uh, it's, there will also be a lot of redundant information. Many of the points will be scanned multiple times, but the software can clean that out. So, uh, yeah. Oops, sorry. So this is. Uh, now you know, photos from last or maybe two years ago even not 100 percent sure i think it's two years ago uh yeah so um so what ha what is happening there what are we looking at now uh let me first go back to this photograph we are scanning visually right so what we're doing is or what actually the the uh, the hardware is doing it is basically um sending light it is it is shining light onto the object and then it's recording the reflection of that light 
and from uh, the angle and actually phase of the light and everything you can calculate how far the point is that uh, that is reflecting that light and this is actually the scanning now if we are scanning something that doesn't reflect any light we cannot scan it right so it is uh, it is really the the effectivity of that process is really based on on the light reflecting properties of the object now this object is black and black doesn't really reflect a whole lot of light this is why it's black right so this is also one of the reasons why i chose this part because it makes it clear that uh, we need to do this and this is what we're doing here is or what this gentleman is doing that that is in charge of the machine he is spraying the object with a light gray spray and it's called developer spray and and the the purpose of that spray really is to do that to give an object a color and a reflective quality that is ideal for scanning because the the other thing that 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 we cannot have is a so-called glare which means hard light reflexes that we get from very shiny surfaces right so we cannot scan black and we uh, or very dark colors very well and we cannot um scan highly shiny or polished surfaces really well because they create create glare uh, and then this developer spray takes care of both of that it gives the object a matte surface so no more glare and it's also in a color that will reflect uh, most of the light so it's a light color in this case it's light light gray and so you he went outside that's a typical scenario at our university one of the uh, outside areas where you can see the air conditioning system here uh, he, he's spraying the object and then after that he's uh, he's back on the scanning table so that's uh, probably granite table uh, and um, he is putting on the target stickers uh, or that's not true he's cleaning the target stickers he put on the target stickers first then he sprayed it and then he uses a q-tip i think one of these cotton wool things to clean the developer spray of these stickers and uh and actually this spray you can wash it off pretty easily uh of, of course you, you don't want to you don't want to ruin your, your pieces here so now next step would be adjusting and calibrating the camera and you can see that there's a bunch of these target stickers on the table itself too that that makes it easier for the software to to again to process the the scan information and uh, and obviously what you can see the actual camera is uh, on some sort of mount a uh, pretty stiff mount of course we don't want any inaccuracy through a flexible mount and here it just basically throws uh, this window of blue light on it and what what we don't see with our naked eyes is is really uh, how uh, what information is in this light so that there's a grid in them and so on and so on so the uh, and it's not just one camera it's multiple cameras you can you can see at least two here um, and to be honest I'm at the moment I'm not aware of the specs of that thing I'm kind of lazy with these things because it's there already I might have known the specs of that system two years ago uh, but now I've forgotten it so when you uh when you scan what you've just seen which is this mouthpiece laying on on the table on the flat side uh you can you can move the camera around it you can also rotate the table right this is why it's round uh so you you actually can just set up the camera where it is let it stand there and then in this case rotate the table and that if you have a good view if the the geometry of of the object allows that you can see it from all sides around so this would be the result of that only one um well situation that you see here right um so the bottom of the mouthpiece the flat side it's not completely flat but but the this is the side where you, you clamp the the reed on is not visible what you see here is uh this is the the raw unprocessed scanning information of that view um you see only the outside skin that could be seen you see the uh the markers of uh the stickers that that were uh, placed on the table around it then you see a few it looks like dirt here and that basically is dirt that's like random 
points that were scanned off the table surface, uh, but you don't see a lot more of the of the table, and that is because the machine simply knows uh, it it shouldn't be scanned, or it simply doesn't scan it because it's matte black, so it doesn't really get a lot of reflection from that table, right? Um, now we want to have the complete surface of that mouthpiece so we turn it around maybe we stand it up similar to the first image and the computer will later realize oh this is the same sets of surfaces that i've been scanning already so it can put the different scan information together into one into the same 3d space um, and and this is that what was done afterwards of course and um and then we have scan data that is the complete outside a geometry and you remember maybe the, the hole on one side and the window on the other to some degree we can if we can look in there we can also scan it we can certainly not scan more than we can actually see with the naked eyes uh, sometimes even less um yeah and and then uh when we've scanned enough data we have an awful lot of 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 points that were scanned point information Again, many points have been scanned many, many times. So there's a lot of redundant information in there. So there is a computer-based uh, uh, optimization of that. Um, and uh, the other thing is we still have all the stickers in the scan. So you, what you see here on the screen is, is this person cleaning up the, the raw scan data. So some, of the, some areas will just have to be deleted, like this. Whoa, sorry. Uh, uh, these red points here, probably reflections from the last scanning step from the table. They just they just need to be deleted manually. And then we have all these round holes here. These were obviously the the marker stickers that were there. So they they, they will be manually closed uh, by him um, as a, as a special service. So there's some sort of functionality uh, similar uh, to 3D CAD that would allow. Uh, this person to to uh, close these holes with standard operations because this is then not scanned information so on principle it's not accurate uh, but in reality that is uh, more than enough now what you see here is again um, the scan the cleaned up scan data shown on screen in my uh, CAD system and again I'm not showing edges if if I showed edges that would be all black because the resolution he he chose here, this gentleman is extremely high, and you can you can tell how high it is. This mouthpiece is just that long, maybe, uh, and you can you can very clearly say see the two engravings or stamps of the Yamaha brand here on the shank, and the custom engraving here. So uh, you can you can tell how high the resolution is. It's pretty amazing, uh, but of course that's a lot of data. Often you don't need that resolution. So again, the resolution has to be chosen in accordance to what what you really need so uh the next bit that we'll that we'll deal with is what do we actually do with the scanned data because we this is not the data that we that we're going to use for production uh this is only data that we use uh, as a reference to create a new cad model and our new cad model should have features uh like we should have just a limited number of very clear features in the model tree. And in order to do that, we, we really need to understand how the original geometry came to be. And there was a human being behind that. And, and there was also a CAD technology behind that, probably maybe only a, a drafting technology, maybe only, um, uh, maybe it was only based on 2D drawings, right? And it's helpful to, to understand that because then if we understand the thought process and the design process uh, of the original component we can just follow that and that is what what i mean by design intent we we need to recognize that now what 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 are good examples for design intent and regular geometry for example symmetry is uh, is uh, this a, a geometry that was meant to be symmetrical and then if yes, then it would be extremely helpful to uh, have the um, plane of symmetry uh, or maybe rotationally symmetric. 
then we want to have the axis of rotation. And then the surfaces. Are there actual, actually surfaces that are meant to be flat, plain? Um, that seems to be very easy, uh, simple, but in, in, a, in a finished part, in a real part, you will almost never find an exactly plain surface. Because uh, maybe as a result of the production processes or because it's worn, each surface is not perfectly flat anymore, or it might be distorted from, from shrinkage or whatever, right? Or because uh, uh, of, of uh, a painting, uh, sorry, not, not painting, uh, a varnish uh, uh, that was put onto that surface is not perfectly flat. So we really need to realize uh, originally other surfaces that, that were meant to be plane surfaces. Is there geometry that is extruded? or rotated, right? Um, and then finally, and that requires the most experience, you, you distinguish geometry from main geometry to uh, just form features like fillets uh, and production related tolerances. Um, uh, so if I, if I maybe go back to this mouthpiece, uh, this for example is obviously a fillet, right? Um, and it's connecting two main surfaces. So this seems to be um, a surface with a straight section that looks like a cone a bit, that overall surface. And from that cone, we cut off the front bit and then we rotate off that last bit that I called shank before. And then this is just a rounding, right? So originally these two surfaces might intersect, uh, resulting in, in, uh, in a sharp edge. And then in the original design, there was just a rounding put on there, right? And this is what I mean uh, by when I, well, when I say distinguish main geometry from, from form features. Okay. Yeah, so that would be a, a, a more analytical part, just looking at the scan data or the original part to, to recognize design intent this way, taking notes. And then uh, the first, First creative step in the CAD system would be to create datums. And I have some detailed instructions for that. And then uh, you would start creating a main geometry as parametric surfaces. In this case, surfaces, of course, with more simple geometry, it might be parametric bodies. Uh, and then we just adjust parameter values, change numerical values until our model is extremely close to the scan. Uh, because this is what we're trying to achieve. So this is really what you need to understand. We're not really using the actual scan data to produce new engineering data. We're only using that as a visual or maybe even dimensioning, measuring reference. And then we delete the scan data at the end, right? Now you might, you might expect that the computer does that automatically and it is, indeed uh, possible or, or realistic there is uh, software available that that does all of this automatically where based on algorithms the software uh, recognizes regularities in the scan geometry for example it would recognize oh this is meant to be a cylinder this is meant to be a plain surface uh, and then uh, the intelligence in that software would recreate a parametric model uh, based on that uh, now, even if this software exists, I have no interest in teaching you that software uh, because it, uh, it is not really necessary to use that software in most cases. It's much more effective if, if all that intelligence happens inside your own head. Uh, and also this, this software typically is extremely expensive, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm giving you uh, these instructions to uh, force you to use your own intelligence uh, and engineering rationale, and uh, of course save a lot of money too. And then after you adjusted the parameter values, so your main surfaces approximate the scan surfaces reasonably well, then you would just create fillets. And then the very last step is you delete the facet model. You de delete the scan data out of your CAD file. Okay. Um, so I'm, I'm, just, I'm just giving you an outlook here. This is uh, what I did based on the scan. Um, and uh, so you, you should already recognize what is light blue. These are surfaces created in Creo. 
um, and uh, you will see uh, you see all these black things these black things are actually the lines of the facets of the little triangular facets and of course i didn't bother uh, copying the custom engraving or stamp and the yamaha stamp uh, and this is where you can can see my my new soft software uh, my new surfaces protrude this the scan surface and on the front bit the the pointy bit um, the uh, you see that um uh, on on the on the front on on this corner the blue comes out more than on the other side and this is frankly because probably the the original mouthpiece is not perfectly symmetrical right it's uh this was this was made from a mold from natural rubber and this mold is not 100 percent symmetrical so but my cd model is right so uh this is another reason why you don't need to 100% approximate or copy the original data that you get from a scan because the original geometry might not be very good, might not be very perfect. You don't want to copy the mistakes that came from mediocre tooling or maybe just wear. Maybe just this thing is worn down. This is a, this is a mouthpiece I got um, together with, with an old saxophone I bought at some point in time. Right? So there you go. Um, so the uh, this is by the way when when I delete or just hide the facet features the actual scan data this is what my surface model looks like now I'm cheating a bit here or I'm 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 inviting you to cheat uh, because this will be your assignment I will give you the scan data and and I want you to uh, to basically produce this surface model now what you don't have to do is you don't need to model any of the internal geometry now if anyone watching this uh, who is produce, producing saxophones and mouthpieces. Now, you will know that the internal geometry is, of course, the most interesting bit of the mouthpiece design. Uh, and I'm not saying that I'm not interested in the internal geometry, uh, but for the students, you don't need to do that. There is, however, one, uh, and we'll look at that in a second, uh, one bit of the external geometry that is kind of sensitive, and interesting to the saxophone playing and making community, and that is the uh, the the facing curve on on the the other side, the flat side side of the mouthpiece. And actually, I, I think I will give a little bit away here in this session that might be interesting uh, for saxophone nerds. So, but the the actual general engineering interest here is is the first step or the second step is how do I actually create a uh, datum geometry, so datum planes, datum uh, axes, and so on. Um, if you never thought about it, this might uh, be trivial, right? But if you're actually trying to do it, it's not so trivial. Now you have a whole, you have billions. I don't know how many points are in this camp, but a lot of points. Uh, and you might think, well, it's, to create a plane is easy. Just just uh, uh, take three points, right? And this is actually true, but then uh, the scan data is not very accurate, right? Because the the actual part that you scan, there is no real plain flat surface, right? So you need to uh, have strategies, especially with very big parts, how you get uh, how you can create datums in the, within the scan data that are useful. Um, so, for example, uh, first point: you can create a datum plane by picking three facet points that are as far apart as possible of the scan data, right? So you know by theory, three points will do it, but take three points that are as far apart from possible on a given surface. Uh, and then you should always, you should always in your mind, you should always be aware that all the datums you create based on actual scan data are inaccurate, right? Uh, so really, uh, spend some time analyzing thinking about it how can you get the best quality datum planes now how do you create axes uh, axes are, are a problem because uh, you can't use uh, scanned points scanned geometry for axes uh, typically you can't there is no physical representation of axes uh, so there's no scan data so this is how i create axes you find 
uh, you find cylindrical or round features, and then you sketch a circle in a plane that that is appropriate. You really sketch a circle, and then you manually push that circle around until it matches uh, the scan data as good as possible. And then the center point is a point of the axis. So if you have a really long cylinder, I actually do that twice. Let's say I'm scanning a tube. Uh, then I would do that at the two ends. I would sketch a circle in space, and I would use the two center points, and uh, then create an axis through the two center points. That would be as accurate as possible. Uh, if I have only, if I can only do that once, like with this mouthpiece, I can only do it once. I would, I would sketch a circle on the end of that shank where I have that that circular hole, the cylindrical hole, uh, and this is how I would do my. Uh, my axis, and I will show you in a minute. Uh, yeah, and then uh, the position of a symmetry plane should be defined by two mirrored datums with a known distance. Uh, and this is uh, this is not the case with the mouthpiece, but that was the case with this motorbike part, this head of the front uh, of the front uh, um, fork. Of that motorbike, so this is this would mean that I would actually do the two axes for the two shock units first. Um, so I would probably draw. Um, well, they need to be parallel too, right? So I have to do a, a, a bit of faking here. If I go back to this motorbike part, this one here, right? So the main the main axes uh, are are this hole and that hole. So what I would actually do is I would. Uh, I would create uh, sketching planes first and uh, sketch circles in there and then manually adjust them in space until they're extremely close to, to these actual scanned holes. Then I would have two axes and then I, that would create the main symmetry plane, which is of course somewhere here, based on that. And then if I'm very lucky, that symmetry plane also is extremely close to uh, to or identical to the position of the axis of that center hole. Uh, so sometimes it's it's like a little bit pushing, pushing. And the good thing is in CAD, you, you can push it around for hundreds of millimeters uh, and approximate um, approximate reality as closely as possible. So uh, so so I would say the uh, the the most interesting bit uh, really is to create. Uh, the uh, the datums based on the scan data uh, and understanding how the original geometry came to be and so I'll try to uh, to lead you through the steps of that mouthpiece so you, you'll see all of that um, thank you for listening you should now see my CAD system uh, I will go to the working directory where I stored the scan data. Um, and that should be in the CAT folder of last year because this is when I made the scan. Great. Now, when I open, I, what I now want to open is the scan data. Um, the scan data will be given to you or you can ask uh, for STL files and STL stands for stereolithography, and and basically that is uh, this file format is created for three D printing stereolithography, uh, and um, it basically the only uh, data it represents are a lot of points, as I said already, points in space. So you, I can't see it here, and this is because it's as all software first only looking for its own file formats. So I'll change type to all files, and then I see mouthpiece stl and uh actually um i can i can import it as either geometry or facet but i just choose automatic i never change anything in these settings and um depending on how how much data you have this might take a while but here it's pretty fast so here you see the actual scan data and let's look at that first for a second that's pretty interesting um if you move it around like this you already see that uh that this is not complete um logically you can only you can only scan the 
the visible surfaces, right? And then if, if we look in here and into the front face, uh, you can see that this is a visible surface here on the bottom. On the other side, obviously for some reason it wasn't scanned. Uh, maybe because it wasn't visible or because it was dirty or something. So uh, this is kind of weird to look at. And, and the, in, the surfaces we see when we look in, these are not the inner surfaces of the part, but these are is the inside of the outer surfaces, right? So um, same here, this hole, we, we assume this will be a cylindrical hole, right? Not a conical, we assume it's cylindrical on, uh, on the inside. It couldn't be scanned, right? Uh, so instead we see the backside of the Yamaha um, stamp. And now also for the saxophone nerds, we see, oh, this was a six facing, uh, 6.0 M. Interesting. Okay. Wonderful. Now, uh, this is just the shaded view. If I do shading with edges, uh, I mentioned that many times, you will see the facets. Uh, you will see these lines that are just created by the software for visualization purposes only. So the file really contains only the geometry of the points here, and all the other stuff is created by the software just to be able to show it on screen properly. And, uh, and, and if you understand the, the, the function of, of the saxophone mouthpiece, you know that this is actually supposed to be a flat surface, although some producers uh, produce a little concave shape. I don't believe in that, by the way. I believe in flat tables. It's called the table. And then the front end, this is uh, curved. And uh, very in interesting for engineers. This is curved because the function of that is you you uh, you strap or you clamp uh, a, a reed on it, which is a very thin uh, um, object. So it bends, and you actually make it vibrate by blowing into it. So this curve, ideally, uh, is identical to the free bending curve of the saxophone reed. Many people don't understand that. It's so simple. Um, so anyhow, <laughs> um, the, you should understand that. So before you, before you start to really reverse engineer uh, a saxophone mouthpiece, you should understand what, what you're looking at. So this is called the table. The rear end should be flat. And then at some point, the flatness starts uh, going into a curve line. And uh, yeah, I think we might actually uh, look at how to model that curved end. Now the, the rear end, that could have any shape, but in reality, the, the end on the right side, that should be flat, that should be a plane. It might not be a plane, it might have some weird shape. In this case, it is supposed to be plain, at least rotationally symmetric. Although technically it, it could be cut off under, under an angle or anything. But in this case, we are lucky this is supposed to be flat. Uh, and then in the real mouth, mouthpiece, there's a little bit, you can see here, a little bit of the cylindrical surface is still there. And then there's a nice chamfer, a beautiful engineering kind of chamfer here. I well, I can't really, because it always highlights the whole facet when I go over it. Maybe I just go to none. Maybe quill. So now it does shouldn't highlight anything. Uh, so here. That is the chamfer, beautiful. So that would be a good example of, of secondary uh, um, geometry. I would not model that first. I would model that very much at the end, just using a, uh, a chamfer feature, right? Um, but this ring here, I, I assume now, and I have all reason to assume that this is meant to be a plain flat surface. And you can already tell on the outside, we'll have a little fillet at the end. So if I look at that, I, I, I will start thinking, well, this is obviously meant to be symmetrical, right? So I would like to have a plane uh, of symmetry here. And uh, this table, uh, this flat surface here, is meant to be flat. And uh, this is perpendicular to the plane of symmetry. But you can see there's this weird angle. Hmm. We don't know the angle yet. Now, what I would also see is I have the flat surface, the ring, ring at the end. 
and uh, this hole is supposed to be a cylinder right so this is where i will how i will start uh, what i described first i will uh, i will try to create this axis that is the axis of the cylinder and my strategy to do that is i will first uh, create a datum plane that is identical to that to that ring shaped flat surface at the end here and then in that plane i can sketch a circle and i can actually in real life i would first take the the diameter of the actual mouthpiece with my slide caliper and then i knew the diameter of the circle now i don't have it I, it's somewhere here but i don't know where uh, i missed that chance so i will just uh i will just look at and it just do the whole thing visually, which is which is fair enough to create just the axis. Yeah, and then when I have this initial uh, initial axis, what I can actually do is together with that table surface, I can uh, I can create my first datums, and I can pretty soon create uh, um, a datum plane that represents the plane of symmetry but step by step so first datum and as i said already i know in theory any any three points on that ring surface will create a plane but of course in real life they're not really in this plane so in order to maximize my um, uh, accuracy i will choose three points as far apart as possible like three the three fingertips uh and so and now when you when you pick these points you have to be careful you don't pick a facet line uh that would already represent two points and also what is wicked here is that uh you might accidentally pick a point behind uh the point that you believe you click on right so you have to be kind of really careful here uh okay so there's also this fillet at the end which makes it kind of uh annoying here so i just believe this is one point over there and then, then i'll create uh pick one one here with my control button down this one and then one over here so as far apart as possible uh bam so now i have three points that should give me a plane and there you go so this one looks very much and it should be very close to what i'm looking at great so now i have a datum plane and as i said already in that datum plane i will create a sketch and that sketch uh, is a circle that is as close as possible to the original cylinder actually the diameter really doesn't matter at all um, although it would be really helpful uh it just needs to be concentric on principle so you see what i'm doing here uh damn i, I wish i would have actually uh checked that first uh really measured that 15 is kind of close enough now now you might ask yourself if you're really following me is uh what is your reference in space here and the good thing is the the part the scan part comes with uh with the coordinate system so that in this data set obviously there is a zero 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 x y z but it but you can you can see you can check where it actually is just uh you will see it's just some random position right so the actual position of that thing doesn't help me uh, but at least i can now define two dimensions for the axis and uh you can i can now spend any amount of time uh changing uh, these two dimensions for the center of that circle uh, but i will not just for the sake of demonstration here um i will assume this is close enough of if this was like a real job a real project of interest i would uh i would be very careful and check that many times and i will now uh show you another technique how to do that but I think, actually, I think this is not the, 
the actual cylinder that I'm comparing it to at the moment, but it's more like the chamfer outside. Well, it really doesn't matter for, for the demonstration. Now, the problem here is I, I made a little mistake. I, I want to have this center point. I don't have it yet. I can't use it yet. So I should have sketched the point. I'm going back into the sketch. And I reminded you many times on the left side of the sketching menus, the datums we have there. These are datums that I can see uh, when I leave the sketch. So now I have this little point. It's hard to see. There, the red thing in the middle. Now I can make an axis that is going through the point, and it should be perpendicular to the or normal to that thing. So now I have an axis. And actually, I forgot to mention before that why I believe this axis is important. I should be, uh, because I know the saxon, of course, I know that this hole is cylindrical. Uh, and one thing you will only really understand if you look at this thing long time is that, wow, the main shape of this mouthpiece is actually a tapered, well, a tapered cylinder sounds stupid, so some sort of cone. So the, the most of the surface is, is one cone. You, while I'm rotating it around the axis, you can see that. So this is why I want to have the axis too, because now I can, I can uh, actually uh, sketch a, uh, a conical surface and I approximate that to the, um, to the scan surface. Now I would like to have the axis of symmetry, uh, sorry, the, uh, the plane of symmetry. I know it goes through this axis, but I don't know where it is and the angle. So the only other thing I can use of the scan is, is that surface that is supposed to be uh, a plane surface. So again, I'm creating one here with the same strategy as before. I'm just selecting three points of the scan as far apart as possible. Uh, facet vertex, right, I have two, and then maybe one here in the back. Now everybody who is a gear nerd with saxophones know that on actual mouthpieces they are rarely really flat, but here this will have to do. So this is the plane that represents the, uh, the, ta the table of the mouthpiece facing. And now I can create uh, the, my, my main datum uh, the, uh, the, the plane of symmetry, I say, well, it goes through that axis. Let's assume the axis is correct and it has to be normal to that surface here, uh, to that, that, that plane here. And it already is. So this allegedly is pretty close to uh, my plane of symmetry. So I'll just cheekily call that symmetry. Symmetry. Bam, there you go. And now I can, for example, create uh, a, a rotated surface in this one. And, and this is pretty neat because it's kind of visual how I'm working now. Of course, uh, you know you have to create all the parameters to make this a robust model, a ro robust model. So um, this axis. I believe is uh, the rotational axis for a conical surface, a, uh, a cone that is the main shape of their body. So I'll just, what I'll do is, and please don't try to catch the actual points. So this is uh, what I believe the original cone is now. If you, if you now draw this line, you will see that the surface isn't really a straight line or the silhouette of that surface isn't really a straight line. It's, it's kind of curved. But here I, I just say, well, the original designer didn't intend this to have this slight curvature. This is just uh, a result of uh, the inaccuracies in the tool making. Um, and maybe uh, a result of the polishing of that mouthpiece, right? 
which which kind of uh, creates these these roundings as, as an unwanted or maybe even wanted side result, right? So uh, what you should do is is uh, offer some uh, or define some proper uh, parameters here. So you could do the diameter of this. Where is it? Cannot create specified dimension. And why not? Ah, because I haven't created a center line. Sorry, I forgot. Center line first. I thought it was there already, but it wasn't. It was only the datum. And now, so you could do that. Diameter here. Because it will be a weird number for many reasons. Diameter here. And then what I could do actually is uh, I could actually place this endpoint on this plane. Um, and of course, I need to define where that endpoint is. And this is this is where I like to use the modify button quite a lot. Of course, here. It needs to be long enough right up to the tip, then maybe a good idea to give it a good regular number. And then uh, using the modify on this dimension, I can approximate that. And trust me, normally this was real work. I would, I would really geek out here completely. Hmm. You can you can actually increase the sensitivity, although you you move the slider to the left to increase the sensitivity. That doesn't seem uh, logically right, but so now I'm I'm changing the 1907 slightly, and of course I can just approximate it. But this looks pretty good. So say okay. And here I have uh, a conical surface to approximate the scan. It's slightly too small. Uh, most of the points are sticking out here, but, but for now that's good enough. Um, okay. And then what is uh, a low hanging fruit, so to speak, very easy to do is create uh, a surface that represents the table. I already have uh, the plane there, so it will just be basically identical with the plane, just to make the point. Uh, so just a straight line. You know what? I'll take these edges as references. So at least my straight line has, and if I merge that, See, my, even my computer is kind of overwhelmed with the amount of data. See, now I have these two, two surfaces already. I can, I can merge them with each other and it will start looking a bit like the finished mouthpiece already, just a bit of course. Now, um, the biggest challenge uh, will be and it's not a very big challenge, uh, will be the, the beak, the, the shape of that front end. And uh, I'll just move to that point. If you look at that, uh, this surface seems to be curved with a constant radius throughout. So maybe here a good strategy would be to Maybe I'll just do it. Why not? It's still early. Um, so what I will do now do is I will create uh, a curve line that represents the side view. Oh, speaking about side views, let's just define a side view. This would be front, and this would be right. And let's call this side view 
save. Okay. Mm, so let's do this one. So I will create this curve that is basically this silhouette. And then you could just uh, sweep a surface along this. Maybe not 100% the same thing, but for now it should be good enough. Um, yeah, so I'll sketch, make a sketch here. Uh, I will use this as a reference. Is it already a reference? It is already a reference. So here, just start here, end here. And uh, this thing looks like a radius, uh, but actually it doesn't look like a real radius. It looks more like, I hope I can call this, it looks more like um, a spliny curve. And we did splines last week quite extensively. So I will just go crazy with the spline, making that tangent here and there. And this is one of the, the few times where you just drag and drop to play stuff. But then I will, uh, here this point actually could be a bit higher. Sorry if I'm, I look really stupid because uh, with my old man glasses trying to see the screen, that, that should be good enough. Just make sure that this uh, end point is, so see, I need to stretch that up a bit here. That is close enough, he said, and changed it anyhow. Silly boy. Now that is close enough. And now the front end, move that in a bit. See the the beak, is that called a beak? The the French call it le bec, der schnabel. Uh, so I, it might be called a beak. So now I just end some uh, dimensions here just to make sure that they're not accidentally changed. So look what I'll do here if I don't want to change it. Right hand click. No, I'm not doing it. I first have to change to the select mode. Click on the dimension, right hand click and lock. Uh, same uh, here with these weak dimensions. I first declare them strong. I, I don't change the value. So I, I just manipulated them by dragging them around. Uh, but I don't want that to change anymore. So I just lock them. I think they're automatically strong if they're locked. Just locking them would be enough. Maybe not. Uh, and then this angle. I can, I can, darn, I can unlock them if I have to later on. Okay. So I assume everything is locked. Now this curve, I can use, I can, of course I could, I could use uh, a boundary blend too, but actually I believe this is a, a simpler, a simpler shape here because it looks very much like 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 a cylind a bit of a cylinder here, so I'll just use a um, an arc, and for that that will be a sweep. References the trajectory as this curve. Now I should be able to define a sketch. Funnily enough, the sweep is not a complicated thing but still confuses me anyway so here is the starting point um at the moment i'm, I'm kind of guessing the the radius um so what i'll do is i'll do a, a center arc just be careful not to catch anything you don't want to catch haha <laughs> that is not a, not meant to be a corona joke uh, tasteless sorry about that one that's symmetrical okay that was over con constrained a simple vertical will in be enough because i already placed the center of the arc midpoint yeah midpoint we don't want to have a midpoint 
Okay, now it's fine. Again, the uh, that would be good to define this dimension. And uh, then the radius is the only thing that can be adjusted later on, but I can do that later on. It's a warning, there's no solid geometry, but I don't even want solid, I want a surface. That's pretty close. Uh, the, the whole thing is, is in a bit too much, but that's uh, be, because my um, trajectory is, is a bit too much in, right? But you see, it is close. I, I should move the whole trajectory out a bit. Um, so if I reactivate the, the other surfaces, I, I can now uh, merge this one with this. And it really starts looking like a mouthpiece already right now uh what you what you still need to do is a, a rotated form feature for the shank for the the rear bit um then that's done the rear bit is done uh of course without the the fillets and the chamfers you don't have to do any internal geometry for now uh just Pretend there is no internal geometry, pretend that's solid. For the tip, uh, that would be a uh, an extruded piece of surface for that, that tip geometry, because it's not really as, as pointy as it is here. And then, okay, I'll do, I'll do the, the, the bit that, that mouthpiece, a connoisseur will wonder about the facing curve. Then, well, I'll be giving away, giving away something interesting here. See what happens here. See if if you look at this area, uh, where the where my blue model surface and the scan data uh, is visible. See if I move that around. No, it doesn't do it anymore. Doesn't matter. Anyhow, so you, you see how my 3D geometry actually approximates that. Uh, okay, so let's do the facing curve. I'm giving uh, industry secrets away here. Because some people who have a big name in the, in, in the industry, they actually pretend they can make facing curves as a sequence of constant radius bits, which is nonsense. Uh, so, Let's do that. I will, will I sketch it first? No, I think I can, I can straight away do an extruded surface. And um, now I can see an awful lot. Should have done this before. Uh, so that's a good thing. So, so let's say it's flat until around here and then it's curved so it's a pretty easy thing to do hope no one sees that video just go like that so that's that is a spline so it will a spline mathematically will behave like something you bend which is a good thing talking about the bending of reeds so that is uh, as as we did last week, I, I'm I'm defining only I'm defining the the spline only by uh, oh yeah tangents only by uh, uh, the the angles of the end tangents. And you see how ridiculously close this is already. I just need to modify the angle of the end tangent. This one. I'm going really sensitive here. Oh, sorry, this is not the angle. I'm I was confused here. Cancel. Uh, no, this should be uh, the position of that point. That would represent the facing length. Um, so you would actually define this dimension differently as I do now, but I don't. 
Um, no, I, I'm, what I want to manipulate is the angle. And I think this dimension is the angle. Modify this. No, this seems to be something else. I first have to constrain the position of that point. Again, I lock everything. Lock this. Lock that. Now, please let this be the angle. Or oh, can lock this one too. See the the actual the actual endpoint of this curve doesn't matter um too much so this again should be finally tangent angle and still there you go see this was like one minute job and it's already extremely close so this is why i'm not ready to pay a lot of money for a mouthpiece not yet uh of course, you still have to make it, but the design of a Murphy is like, hmm, give me an afternoon. Yeah, I want to have a surface. Uh, no, I'm being unfair here. Of course, it's not about the CAD design, it's, it's behind the, the issue here is uh, the effect. that the different form features have on the behavior of the mouthpiece. So uh, I'm not sure I can actually merge this properly, but it seems to be working. Yeah, see, bam. Now again, the tip you have to cut off um, with, a, with an extruded surface in that view, for example. See, my symmetry is not 100% right. Um, I could have been more careful with that circle and everything. But it's extremely close. And it might actually, here you see the how my surface cuts through that, that mesh. It's not 100% not symmetrical. That might be the, the actual geometry, geometric quality of the scan or the mouthpiece that was scanned. But more likely, I could be more accurate with my surfaces here. This is pretty close already. You see how this, this blue patch here is looks like a puddle of water on that surface. And, and that is be, because it's coming out of the mesh. But in other areas, it's lower than the mesh. And that, that tells me that my, my geometrical approximation of the scan is pretty good on the one hand, and that the, the actual surface is not 100% flat, but it is. Uh, it has a little dip there. It has the dip where you can see my blue surface. And again, I, I mentioned that before. Some mouthpiece makers say, well, it, it, I, this should be concave to assure uh, sealing of the reed. But that is a discussion that is not needed in our master program, MESD, Mechanical Engineering Simulation and Design, here uh, at the Thai German Inter uh, the Searing Torn International Thai German Graduate School of Engineering in Bangkok. So if you want to be a mouthpiece designer, come and join our master program. Anyhow, I'm not finishing that. That would be too easy for you. The rest you can do yourself. Uh, so again, be careful, uh, chamfers and fillets, not to model them as main geometry as surfaces, but just as features at the end. And again, you don't have to do the internal geometry. Just uh, so forget about this hole going in there. Forget about this window that you see here and everything that is inside. Just give me a solid model. Also, you don't need to do any engravings. So that's basically the end of my demonstration. And um, when you're done with your, uh, with your surface modeling, the last thing you can do is you can actually um, delete that facet model. And even if we use, that, that was surprising for me to learn too. Even if we did use uh, at least three points of the original geometry, uh, we can still delete the facet model. 
uh, typically in a in a Creo model that would mean you're deleting references so the whole thing can't be regenerated but for some weird reason this is not the case with using uh, facet vertex um, they they I guess the the uh, coordinate information of these is copied somehow or absolutely referenced whatever so we and that's the good thing because the file size is gigantic because of the scan data but if I we, but if I don't need that scan data anymore, uh, now I'll just suppress it. Fancy that. <laughs> no, what I, what I just said doesn't seem to be true now. Somehow the, uh, the facet, oh no, sorry, I was, I was, I was. Now this is the facet model. That I should be able to suppress here, yeah, right? So what, in the end, what, what stays is only my own geometry. And uh, I can actually also delete it, and then the file size will be really small. So this is when you send me your homework in one week from now, which is this uh, surface model, or you can turn it into a solid if you want to. Uh, make sure to delete the facet model before you email that to me. Okay, I don't want more copies of the facet models. And then your part model will be really small, probably a few hundred kilobytes. But with a with a facet, it would be uh, 100 megabytes. I don't want that. Okay, make a point of that. So uh, that's it for today. Uh, it's probably um, not easy to keep an overview. Uh, what I was what I was talking about because it's quite a lot. The overall topic was reverse engineering, uh, and then from that I moved into uh, basically geometry model modeling based on on optical scan but that's that is basically one aspect of reverse engineering nowadays and I hope uh, I made that point and uh, I hope you feel you learned something interesting today bye bye bye